Hey there, folks. I didn't see you. I'm going to tell you a story and tell me if this resonates. I was straight out of music school. I'm playing in the house band in a jam session in Long Island City, I think. A bass player comes to sit in with the band. We're playing some standard like Stella by Starlight. And when it comes time for the sax solo, I was trying to create some atmosphere. All of a sudden, the bass player locks eyes with me. He starts playing a four feel and he's stomping his foot on two and four. He's stomping so loudly that it shakes the entire room. His message was clear, even if he didn't verbalize it. He was trying to tell me, play the hats on two and four, mother I could make a lesson about jam session Nazis. Oh, wow, uh, dark. It's a really easy one. And let's be real, I probably will at some point, but that's not what I want to talk about today. Today I want to talk about where to play the hi-hats. Maybe you've had an experience like mine, or maybe you've just felt stuck in a rut at a jam session, playing on two and four, tune after tune, wondering, is this all there is? Well, not to worry, I've got you. But first, in artificial intelligence research, there's a concept called the uncanny valley. Yes, I just took it to AI. Stay with me here. The uncanny valley refers to when artificial intelligence robots get pretty close to humans, like this robot but not so close that they're indistinguishable, like, say, Westworld. In the space between bad likeness and perfect likeness is the uncanny valley. And robots in the uncanny valley tend to give us the creeps. Anyway, you probably see where I'm going with this. Between perfect two and four players like Philly Joe and Kenny Clark, and really floaty drummers like Paul Motion and Jack DeJohnette, you've got a hi-hat on Canny Valley. It's not perfectly on two and four, but it's also not perfectly floaty. So let's demonstrate what I'm talking about. It's pretty easy to play a jazz beat if you religiously keep the hi-hats on two and four, like this. There's a whole canon of music in this style, and some of the best drummers in this style are Kenny Clark, Philly Joe Jones, and Arthur Taylor. There's also a lot of great books about how to play in this style, and my personal favorite is The Art of Bop Drumming by John Riley. There's also a big canon of drummers who rarely play the hats on two and four. Drummers like Roy Haynes, Jack DeJohnette, Paul Motion, and Elvin. And at least one great book on that subject, Beyond Bop Drumming, also by John Riley. Basically the concept is you're using the hi-hats as just another comping voice. Like this. So what's the problem? Well, a few things. For starters, many of the best jam session tunes are from the bebop era. It's not without exception. People at music school used to call tunes like Windows by Chick Corea and Speak No Evil by Wayne Shorter, both of them considered modern jazz in their day. But there are just so many great tunes by players like Charlie Parker and Clifford Brown, not to mention the American songbook composers like Cole Porter, Irving Berlin, and Johnny Mercer. And here's an inconvenient truth about jam sessions. The drums are just one instrument on the stage. Every other instrument, from the horn players to the bass, want to play cool changes which also has a big influence on jam session repertoire. Finally, there's the hipster factor. Do you know a deeper cut from an old jazz record than your buddy does? And I have to say that's got a positive peer pressure effect of causing people to learn the history better. And the mixed effect of anchoring a lot of jam session music in one certain kind of idiom. And that's the hi-hat on two and four idiom. Playing like it's the Keith Jarrett trio, or the Chick Corea Now He Sings trio, is going to clash with that idiom. But that's not the only issue. Jam session bands are not working bands. By definition, you've got a hodgepodge of musicians of different backgrounds and ability levels on stage at once. They're often strangers, and as I said, there's going to be a big disparity amongst their ability levels. And nobody wants to sound sloppy on stage, even if it's just a pickup group for one tune. 
That means when it comes to rhythm section playing in a jam session, the clearer the better. Which can also push things in a conservative direction, stylistically. God damn it! I'm back in 2 and 4 jail. All night. Well, not necessarily. There is a third way. A way to be clear, in time and swinging, and without upsetting people's stylistic sensibilities. Or making the band sound loose. And it's two major things. To examine the first, let's check out Max Roach and Mel Lewis. I talked about this in another lesson that I'll link below, but first, let me give you the commandments. Number one, learn to vary the ride cymbal even as you keep it swinging. Like this. Next, learn what length phrases you're making when you phrase the ride symbol naturally. Here, I was making a few phrases of three and then a couple phrases of four, like... So that's two three-beat phrases and one two-beat phrase. Third, do what Max Roach does. For a four-beat phrase, your normal two and four hi-hat works great. For a three-beat phrase, try playing the hats on two. And here I'm going to play as if I'm playing in three just to demonstrate. So if we join that together with two phrases of three and one phrase of two to make two bars of four, it would just sound like this. This is a little advanced, but if you're hearing phrases in five beats, try playing the hats on beats two and five, like this. And again, I'm going to play a couple bars in five so that you can hear what the phrase sounds like. Two, three, four, five. And if you're playing five beat phrases over four, that might sound like this. One, two, one, two, three, four. Now, here's how the whole style might sound if you were playing it organically, as if you were comping with a soloist. One, two, three. Got it? But that's not even the deepest issue. Whatever I was playing all those years ago when the bass player started stomping must not have felt grounded. There are two ways to feel grounded behind the drums. The first is to be sure of what you're playing. That means keep it simple at first. The second, of course, is time. Just as I demonstrated in last week's lesson, if you're getting vibed on stage at a jazz jam session, it's probably because you're making some time mistakes that are causing things not to swing. So practice with the metronome. Practice with it on quarters, yes. But as I said last week, that'll only take you so far because you can still cheat by following the click. So practice all this Max Roach stuff with the metronome on swung eighth offbeats. and also on every fourth eighth. And finally, on beat four of every bar. I've talked to drummers who have done this, and they say they can feel their time getting more solid, and that gives them confidence. I know Kung Fu. But with swing, there's also the issue of the consistency of the distance between your swung eights. Sure, these metronome exercises will help, 
but it also helps to have a benchmark for how you should space your eighth notes. So obviously play along with recordings featuring Kenny Clark, Philly Joe, and Arthur Taylor. But I've also got a slightly controversial hack, hip hop recordings. <laughs> The silver lining of all of this is, if you can make things clear and swinging, you'll be able to get away with a lot more creativity without getting vibed. I've seen a lot of great drummers play in jam session situations, from drummers like Elvin to modern greats like Ari, Eric, and Marcus. Know the number of times they got vibed for playing something creative? Zero. Why? As a bass line, no pun intended, they covered all the bases, oi with the puns, when it came to swing feel. But they also did something extra. They treated the music as if they were co-composers. They always had an uncanny ability to sense what would make everybody feel good and take the song to the best place, and unfailingly they did that. By contrast, I was a space cadet in the jam sessions of my youth. Anyway, I hope you found this lesson helpful. And if you have, and you'd like to go a little bit deeper with some of my content, I recommend you click right below the video player and check out my three free videos in three weeks. That's three videos that I promise will make your playing better in the next three weeks than it's gotten in the next six months. To get that, just click on the link below this player and enter your email and I'll send it to you right away. Guys, it's been fun. I'll be back very soon for another lesson of the week. Peace. In order to...